Okay. And now I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker of the weekend. Um, she works as an embedded software developer, hardware designer, technical writer, and open source community leader, and she's currently working with Adafruit. Uh, she has a great story of how she got to this point, including a little PyOhio connection, which uh, I think is really neat. She's going to talk to you about how communities and mentors within them um, can make a difference for folks just getting started. Please welcome Katni Rembor. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I am here today to tell you a story about changing lives through open source, passion, and mentoring. This story starts a little over two years ago. I was unemployed and suffering from serious depression. And I decided I was going to learn Python. I had heard about the language over the years from various people and friends and decided I was going to give it a try. So the first thing I did was attempt to find resources. And I found the official Python tutorial, which I thought, OK, this is great. It's probably up to date. Good place to start. <laughs> However, I found that it wasn't exactly written for beginners. It's really written for programmers. Initially, you do a lot of weird math. At the time, this is what I went through. I figured rounds down, I guess. I don't even know what was happening here. <laughs> and apparently minus three means the last three in the list. I don't know why we're defenestrating cats. <laughs> Defenestrate means to toss out a window. I have no clue what's going on here. I do understand this line. And you lost me again. And to be honest, I still don't know what's going on in this example. So I, I hit a wall. And I assumed the problem was me. And so I decided to try and find other resources. So I tried a class. And it really didn't click for me. It didn't speak to my learning style. And it just it didn't put me in a position to feel like I was learning anything. And so I thought maybe it's that I just can't learn Python. And so I started to give up. Around this time, I was given a Raspberry Pi 0W. And I promptly went home and did the thing you do when you get a Raspberry Pi, and that's to buy all the things that go with a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> My first experience with Adafruit was searching for Pi accessories. Adafruit is a woman-owned company based in New York, and they do open source hardware and open source software, and they have an emphasis on learning and documentation. There's really nothing sold by this company that doesn't come with something about how to use it. So I found a really cool board that goes with Raspberry Pi, and it had a bunch of sensors and LEDs built into it, and it was designed to go into space, which I thought was cool. But it didn't really work with the Raspberry Pi that I had. So I decided I was going to try and recreate it by buying all the LEDs and sensors separately. And that got expensive really quickly. So I kept searching, and I found a product called Circuit Playground Express, which I didn't realize also didn't work with Raspberry Pi. Um, but it had a bunch of sensors and LEDs built into it, and it was smaller. So I thought, OK. So I bought it and got it home, took one look at it, thought it was the most complicated thing I had ever seen and put it down for two weeks and didn't touch it. Eventually, I plugged it in and learned that Circuit Playground Express is a microcontroller, which means essentially it's a little computer. And it has a bunch of sensors, buttons, switches, and LEDs built into it. And when I first plugged it in, it was running a demo very similar to this one. It's a rainbow swirl, and it plays a different tone for each LED that lights up. And I remember thinking to myself, 
I am never going to write anything as cool as this demo. <laughs> but I thought, all right, I'll give it a try. So I found out that Circuit Playground Express works with multiple programming languages. And the first language I found is called MakeCode, which is a drag and drop block editor that's based on JavaScript. And I found it just a little bit too beginner for me. I had apparently learned just enough to find it awkward and frustrating. The next language I found was Arduino, which was entirely too complicated and went right over my head. And the third language I found was one mention of something called CircuitPython. And it turns out CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on microcontrollers. So, and it's an open source project that's sponsored by Adafruit. So I managed to get it installed. And within a few lines of code, I made an LED blink. And nothing I had done up to that point in trying to learn Python hooked me as much as that moment. And it was the difference between manipulating data and manipulating the physical world. I wrote code and something physical happened. And it was an immediate response. So I put down the pie, didn't touch it again for quite a while, and decided I was going to find everything I could about this board. It turns out the board was very new. So there was very little documentation and not very many examples. So my first thought was, I'm going to design a project that I can share. So anyone else who is in my position will have more examples to work with. I had previously worked with a couple of open source projects, but really didn't understand open source as a whole concept. And even though I didn't understand that, I, I was incidentally still entering this whole situation with an open source mindset. Because my first thought was to just to produce something that I could share just for the sake of sharing it and making sure that other people had a better experience. So I decided to design a light up tone piano that used the capacitive touch pads around the outside as keys and lit up a different color and played a different tone for each pad. And around this time, I connected with the CircuitPython developer, Scott. He offered to help me with my code and answer any questions I had. But he also told me that if I had any suggestions or improvements for CircuitPython to let him know which I thought was ridiculous. <laughs> I certainly couldn't imagine a world in which I would have something to contribute to a programming language. But it goes back to open source. Again, this was an open source project, and they were looking for anybody to contribute, because the more people you get involved in your project, the better it becomes. Scott told me about the Adafruit community on Discord. Discord is a chat server, for those who may not know. And Adafruit was building a community around the company itself and around CircuitPython. So I joined the community. And what I found was a lot of helpful, supportive, and encouraging people. And I started spending all of my time with them. And every day I left feeling good about people, which is not something that happens on the internet. <laughs> I found that initially, all I was doing was asking questions. And I thought for sure that I was bothering people. But to be clear, no one ever made me feel that way. It was all in my head. People were always willing to answer my questions. They were happy to do so. And everyone was very supportive. And I found within a very short period of time, as little as a week, I started answering other people's questions. There were new people joining the community all the time. And they had the same questions that I had had the week before. And I was able to answer them. And I realized that I was learning. And I started feeling better about myself. I decided at the very last minute to go to Pi Ohio 2017. I had started my project two weeks before and finished the code around this time. And I knew about Pi Ohio through friends. Um, I had known about it for quite a number of years, but had no reason to go. I was not involved in Python. But I thought, OK, I'm trying to learn Python. I've now written some Python. Seems like a good idea. I'll go. I thought I would feel out of place, and that was definitely not the case. When I got here, I was welcomed into an amazing community. I reconnected with friends that I hadn't seen in a long time and met a lot of new people. 
while I was there, I asked Scott if I could write an official learn guide for Adafruit for my project, and I was accepted, which was a complete surprise. And I remember sharing it with a lot of people here and wondering whether I was getting ahead of myself, whether it would actually come to pass. But I headed home to get started. Around the same time, Scott told me that he was working on a library. It was designed to make using CircuitPython with the Circuit Playground Express easier. The code that's the longer piece is the original code that I used to make the LED blink. The shorter bit is that same code using the Circuit Playground Express library. The Circuit Playground Express library does all the hardware setup in the background for you. So instead of having to figure out how to get the code to talk to the LED, all you do is address the LED. And you'll notice as well that the name is different. And it's more obvious. You're addressing the red LED. That's what's in the code. Scott had implemented a few features of the board in this library, and he told me I should finish it. I said, are you kidding me? I have been programming for two weeks. I have no background in programming or electronics. How am I supposed to finish a library? But Scott insisted that I could, and he told me that he was going to help. I have pretty serious imposter syndrome. For those of you who don't know, it's a constant fear of being discovered as a fraud in what you do, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. For me at the time, I had barely started with programming or electronics. I assumed I didn't know anything, that I hadn't learned anything, that I couldn't do anything beyond simple projects. The idea that I could finish this library was absurd. But Scott saw something in me that I did not, and he pushed me to do more than I thought I could. So I dove in. And with Scott's help, two weeks later, which was now approximately one month after starting programming, I made my first contribution to the library. I enabled using tones with the built-in speaker. And I chose that because it was the, one of the main features of my project. And I thought I would be able to use it with my project. So I went through my first change request. And two days later, my code was merged. And I had completed my first contribution. And I, <laughs> and I promptly broke my own code. <laughs> it turns out you can't partially implement things and have it work. It's got to be all or nothing. So I spent the next month writing my guide, providing support on Discord. I built a tabletop lightbox photo studio using the Raspberry Pi that I received. So it did end up getting used. And working on implementing the rest of the features of the board in the library and learning everything I could about programming and electronics. Along the way, Phil, the managing director of Adafruit, came to the community because he wanted help coming up with a tagline for CircuitPython. It was immediately followed by a lot of snake puns. For me, my response was that I explained that whenever I talked about CircuitPython, I always talked about the community. I talked about how amazing the community was. If you had an idea, they would help you make it happen. If you wanted to learn Python, they would teach you CircuitPython. And if you just wanted to share something you did, someone would be amazed by it and absolutely supportive. And I said to him that there'd be no way that I would be as far along as I was if I hadn't stumbled into Circuit Playground Express and Circuit Python. And ended with the fact that it was going to take me more thinking to be able to put that into a snappy tagline. Phil immediately responded with code plus community equals Circuit Python. And this has become both the tagline and everything that Circuit Python embodies. We have put a lot of effort into involving the community and building up the community. And that community has returned the favor in contributing to the code and contributing to the project. And it's what makes CircuitPython so amazing. Throughout all of this, Scott told me I could turn what I was doing into a job. I thought that was ridiculous. I was doing it because it was fulfilling. And I genuinely loved what I was doing. 
and the idea of getting paid for doing something I loved seemed impossible. I was still unemployed, and the prospect of a job was fantastic, but whenever he brought it up, I set it aside, didn't think much of it, really didn't think it was something that was going to happen. I finished up my project, I added fruit. It turns out key limes are smaller than regular limes, and the project ended up named Piano in the Key of Lime. <laughs> and here it is. There's only seven touch pads, so to get the final note, you touch two at the same time. <laughs> In the middle of October, I finished my guide, and on October 20th, it was published. And Adafruit immediately offered to pay me for it. This was amazing, because this is exactly what Scott had been talking about, that I could turn something I was doing because I loved doing it into a job. But I remembered that Scott had mentioned getting paid hourly. So I went back to him and said, hey, you brought this up at some point. You know, is there anything we can do about it? And he said, you need to ask. It took me three weeks to write a very short email because of imposter syndrome and some pretty serious anxiety issues. And when I finally sent it, I was immediately accepted. And I started working part-time for Adafruit, writing code, and providing support on Discord. I severely underestimated the number of hours I was doing. I asked them for 15 and realized very quickly I had been pretty much putting in full time for quite a while. So over the course of the next month, I continued to increase my hours and reach nearly full time around the holidays and decided that I would wait until after the holidays to pursue anything further. A critical moment for me happened over the holidays. I was working with Lamar, who owns Adafruit, and we were working on a code issue with a piece of hardware. And we reached a point where we figured out what needed to happen, but there needed to be some code written. And she said, you should go ahead and write it. I'm going to go get some tea. <laughs> so I did what I always do, and I panicked. Then I immediately reached out to everyone who had ever helped me with anything Python related, and no one was around. So I started thinking about what other code I had written that I could change to make work for this situation, and there wasn't anything. And so I was staring down having to write something from scratch for basically the first time with no help. So I thought, okay, let's give it a try, and I did it. And when Lamore came back, she took a look at it and said, this is correct, and we tested it and it worked. And I realized at that moment that I had been learning. I wasn't just mimicking, I wasn't just receiving help. I had learned the concepts and I was able to produce something on my own. After the new year, it took me another two weeks to write another email and I asked to join Adafruit full time. On January 22nd, I joined Adafruit full-time as an embedded software developer, technical writer, and community leader. In six months, I had gone from aimless depression to earning my dream job. And this was a dream I didn't know I had. I found a passion that I had never considered, and I ran with it, and it worked. None of this would have been possible without the support and encouragement of my mentors. I would have been happy to continue making projects on my own time and making LEDs blink. But I received a lot of help from Scott, from Dan, who is another CircuitPython developer who joined later, and from a lot of my friends. Scott pushed me to do more than I ever thought I could. He helped me along the way and he taught me things, but he didn't just teach me, he made it clear that teaching me was a priority to him. 
Dan always made time for me and had a different approach than Scott. And he always answered any questions that he could. And I found myself utilizing resources beyond Scott and Dan. My, I, have, I had a number of friends who knew Python very well. And I started reaching out to them also. I received a ton of help. And having multiple teaching styles available to me was crucial because I learned different things in different ways. And I was able to identify who could help me with what type of thing and received better help that way. One thing I will say is set expectations with things you receive help on. For example, a work project. Because if you receive help on it that's outside your capabilities and produce code that is perhaps beyond what you actually know how to write, you may be expected to operate at that level moving forward unless you've set the expectation that you received help. No one's going to fault you for asking for help, but you're going to set yourself up for failure if you don't make it clear that you did. Um, it's just a, something that is worth keeping in mind. As I succeeded, I realized I wanted to return the favor. I wanted to pay it forward. But I really didn't think I had anything to offer as a mentor. I didn't know enough to mentor anyone. But it turns out mentoring is not necessarily about knowledge. And there are two people I want to tell you about, Brian and Melissa. Brian I had talked to a number of times through the CircuitPython community and noticed that he disappeared for a while. I saw him online at some point and sent him a message asking how he was doing. And he mentioned to me that there was an interaction that he had with another member of the community that made him feel the need to leave. I was bothered enough by this that I started putting a pretty concerted effort into facilitating his return. I looked into the situation, I talked with the other person involved, and a couple weeks later I reached out to Brian again to tell him that the interaction had not gone as badly as he thought it did, and that his contributions and he himself were both very valuable to our community and we would love to have him back. This meant more to him than I ever could have imagined. He immediately rejoined the community and started contributing again. He became aware of my story of how I joined Adafruit, the story I just told. And he started to think that maybe he could achieve the same thing, even though he also struggled to believe that he had anything useful to offer. It turns out he had a skill set that worked with a project that we were working on, so I introduced him to Phil. It turns out he also had another skill set that worked for something else that we wanted, and so he was asked to write a guide designing circuit boards. He began doing project work for Adafruit and within a month was asked to join full time. Melissa had been following Adafruit as a company for about a decade and joined the community about a year ago. She became interested in CircuitPython at the beginning of 2019 and learned of my involvement in it through our CircuitPython weekly meetings. In response to a call for what the community would like to see out of CircuitPython in 2019, Melissa pointed out that there was a device that she would like to see a driver written for, and she was asked to write it. <laughs> she got right into it, and is, once she was done, I was asked to help her get the code ready to merge. We use Travis CI to test all of our code and make sure that it builds and to ensure that it's linted properly, which is to say that the syntax is accurate. And battling Travis is pretty much a pastime. So I helped her with that, I answered all of her questions, and became her main contact for all questions and issues that she had regarding contributing to Adafruit. She always felt that I had answers, whether it was helping her find documentation, explaining something to the best of my ability, or walking her through how we typically did things. I had also written a post in response to the CircuitPython 2019 call, and it was a blog post that was about the story of how I joined Adafruit. Melissa found my post intriguing, inspiring, and reassuring. She found herself referring to it a few times when she was feeling anxious about things to help her feel better. She continued to do amazing work and was spending a significant amount of time contributing, just as I had in the beginning, and I wanted to see her paid for it. So I messaged her and we chatted for a fairly lengthy period of time and I told her that she needed to ask. 
So she did, and she was immediately accepted. For the next couple months, she continued to rely on me to answer her questions and help her with any issues that she had. And at that point, we discussed her coming on full time. She asked again, and again, she was accepted. I met both Brian and Melissa at PyCon 2019 in May of this year. I was unaware of the importance of my involvement to them joining Adafruit until I found them chatting at some point, and they were comparing notes on their journeys to joining Adafruit and they found that they had one common crucial thread, and that was me. This is my team. This is Melissa, Scott, Brian, myself, and Dan. These are both my mentors and my mentees. I did not see myself as a mentor to Brian or Melissa, but I just did what came naturally to me. I was encouraging, supportive. I shared every bit of knowledge I could, and I built them up. But the most important thing that happened was I shared my story and inspired both of them. Brian and Melissa both made it clear that knowing my story led them to believe that they could achieve the same thing. As much as joining Adafruit was a dream come true for me, being able to help not one but two other people achieve that same dream meant so much more. Being both a mentor and a mentee has taught me a lot about both sides of that interaction. And I want to talk about the important things that I took away from my experiences. As a mentee, you want to ask questions. Your mentor can only help you if you ask. They will be able to give you what information they have, but they don't know where it is that the information is lacking unless you're asking questions. You want to let them know when you need more information. You need to listen. Your mentor is going to try and help you in any way they can, but you have to listen to what they say and do what you need to do to absorb that information, whether it be simply listening, taking notes, or working along with them. Take what you learn and explore it in a way that interests you or speaks to you. This will help you grow regardless, but it's also very useful if your mentor's teaching style does not quite fit your learning style. And to that end, try and find a mentor that fits. And if you find that they don't, don't hesitate to seek out other avenues. Everyone learns differently, and no one will fault you for looking for other options. If at all possible, find multiple mentors. Whether it be that you need more support than one person can reasonably give, that you need more availability from your mentor, or that you need multiple teaching styles, Having multiple resources can be incredibly beneficial. And most importantly, advocate for yourself. Your mentor should always look out for you, but you can never put it entirely on them. You will become more autonomous as you learn over time, and you need to be prepared for that. But the best way is to advocate from your, for yourself from the beginning, because then you'll have your mentor there to support you as you learn. As a mentor, you want to prioritize mentoring. You want to make sure that your mentee knows that you teaching them is a priority for you. And you need to do that through both communication and action. Share your knowledge and experience. Mentoring isn't just about knowledge, but knowledge is valuable. And experience is just as valuable. You need to share the things that you know with people that are looking for that information. But it's OK not to know the answer. If you don't know the answer to something, work with your mentee to find the answer. Finding the answers to things is a skill in and of itself. But you will also gain from learning with someone else. Don't be afraid of your mentee surpassing you. Too often, people think that building others up too much will become a threat to their job security or their career path. And it's not the case. If your mentee succeeds, you have succeeded. Build them up and help them become the best at whatever it is they're trying to do. And you need to be aware that the mentor-mentee dynamic is very special. A negative interaction can have a huge effect. You need to constantly be aware of how what you say and do can affect others. Always be kind, respectful, patient, and understanding. 
And as both a mentee and a mentor, you need to set expectations. Think of things like time availability, best modes of contact, current experience levels, and the scope of what is intended to be taught or learned. A mismatch can lead to disappointment and struggle on both sides, but well-aligned expectations could lead to a very positive experience. So be open and honest upfront regarding what you're expecting from the other side. But expectations changing over time is okay, and continued communication ensures that everyone remains on the same page. If something comes up, especially as a mentor, your time availability changes, you have a reason that you can't be there for the other person, you need to make sure you communicate that. Don't leave anyone hanging. You want to keep all of these concepts in mind, regardless of which side of the interaction you're on. Knowing where another person in a situation is coming from can help with that interaction with understanding and how you engage in it. And the level of engagement that's necessary for a mentor-mentee relationship is significant. And that understanding can be the key to success. If you are trying to learn something, make a change, or any sort of situation where you need help, reach out. Find a community to join. Find someone who knows whatever it is you're trying to learn, and ask for help. Stick with it, even if it takes time. Finding a mentor can be very difficult, but it's incredibly important. I continue to spread my reach, ask more friends, find more resources, and identify who is best at helping me with what, and to learn better about teaching myself. I still continue to struggle with imposter syndrome, and I'm still receiving tons of support. But there's no denying that the more time that passes, the more successes I achieve. The fact is, you will reach a successful place in your life. For me, it meant many things, from solving a difficult coding problem to earning my dream job. And when you succeed, find someone else who's trying to do the same and reach out. Make finding a mentor easier by being one. What I, and your experience, regardless of what level of experience you have, matters and can help someone else. But no matter what, no matter who you are, share everything you can in any way you can with whomever you can because you may end up impacting someone in a way that you never expected. Thank you.